Hi, and welcome to Time Flies, our five-minute interview series. We're here with Matthew Collins, author of Hate, um, My Life in the British Far Right. Matthew, Hello. what is it that makes the far right attractive to people? Well, it's not attractive to everyone, let's be honest. The uh, overwhelming majority of people reject the, the far right in Britain, but I think to a small number of people, uh, the far right offers very, very simple questions to very, very complex questions about the economy, jobs, housing, education and employment. And, you know, it's a quick, violent fix. And uh, some people, mainly in the short term, uh, are quite attracted to it. What's the difference for people at home between the BNP, the National Front and the EDL? Oh, um, well, on the face of it, very, very little. But if I, if I was really to go into it is that, let's say, the EDL is ultra-nationalist, the BNP is fascist and the National Front is Nazi. But at the end of the day, uh, it will make absolutely no difference. The, the difference between them are, would tend to be historically, uh, particularly the BNP and the National Front, the BNP split from the National Front because they felt the National Front was soft. Mm. And the English Defence League it sort of represents a different sort of... Uh, historically, you know, the, the BNP and the National Front would have existed anyway without uh, mass immigration to this country because ideologically they're fascist neo-Nazi parties and you can, trace their, you can trace their links right back to before the war. With the EDL, it's a mixture of racism, anger, people feeling disenfranchised, the growth of identity politics, uh, sort of all bundled up mm. in a small army of football hooligans. Okay. Um, there tends to be a lot of breakups and makeups and kind of splinter yeah. groups and things in, in the far right or in the extreme right. Yep. Why is it that there tends to be a lack of unity in those parties? Because everybody wants to be Führer. <laughs> they, well, they, don't, well, they, they don't have they don't have much they, 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 you know, they don't have much brains between them, and they tend to they will tend to have a leader for as long as he's useful, and and then dump him. And often people, the far right has always been unable to rise to new challenges. If you look at the BNP now, it's on death's door. The National Front's been on death's door for over thirty years, and even the EDL to some degree is now struggling and it, you know, it's, frag it's fragmenting. Mm. Um, basically, it's the nature of their politics. When, when you're involved in hate every day as they are, nothing lasts, least of all yeah. love. What do mm. you make of the links between austerity measures and kind of a potential rise of the far right in this country? Well, this country, the recent elections uh, in, in May 2012, we decimated the far right. Everyone they put up was beaten everybody, and everyone they had up for re-election was beaten. So in this country, there's no evidence to suggest electorally that the far right is a threat. The far right's mm. never really been uh, a threat in this country. The BNP, for instance, were at its height in this country in about 2008, 2009, and no one really, really noticed, you know, at Hope Not Hate, we were out campaigning yeah. against the rise of the far right. Um, and now here we are, three, three years on, the BNP is almost vanquished electorally and people are talking about the rise of the far right across Europe, well, there's no electoral rise here. But then we've never seen, in, in the British context, uh, the far right as an electoral threat. We, we, we tend to feel that the threat from the far right comes mainly from recruitment, violent actions, and, and mm -hmm. you know, how that extends and plays out uh, outside of Parliament. There's also been, a, of course, there's also been a, a growth in, in Europe and in Greece as well, in anti-austerity parties on, on the left, who, who have slightly more... Um, ingenious solutions to, to, austerity, to austerity than just racism and violence. Sure. Um, is engaging nationalist parties in political debate the same as giving them a platform and what do you make of that? Well I believe in no platform. Now it was very very difficult when Nick Griffin was an MEP uh, to always have no platform because he did have a platform. He was an elected member despite the fact he was the last over the line in, in the Northwest. But I believe in no platform purely for purely for the reason that when you allow far-right and fascists to go on television, even if they are challenged on television, it doesn't really challenge what happens in the living rooms, pubs and the streets where people aren't able to defend themselves against those words. Yeah. And people always talk about um, Voltaire. I don't know what football team he played for or what supermarket <laughs> he shops at, but they always say that he spoke about, I will defend your right to say whatever yeah. it is. But of course he never stood outside the gates of Auschwitz and said that. No. Okay, time's up. Thank you very much, Matthew. Just one last question. Oh, yes. Time flies when? Yeah, drinking Rioja at a beachside bar in Sitges. Nice.
Thanks very much for being with us. Cheers.